And turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. We're going to be looking at the subject of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the work of the ministry. Holy Spirit anointing. And in Luke chapter 4, and verse 14, we see something quite unusual. Maybe if you're familiar with the Bible, it won't strike you as being very unusual. But I think it should be. And that is that Jesus Christ had help in doing his ministry here on earth. Luke chapter in verse 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. <coughs> and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily, I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, and, and unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel, in the time of Eliseus the prophet, none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him under the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Thank you. you may Praise the Lord. It. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, and verse 14, we see something that uh, should strike you as being quite unusual. Uh, perhaps familiarity breeds contempt. We've read these portions so many times. We who know the Lord. But it says here that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Have you ever asked yourself the question why Jesus needed the Holy Spirit's power in his life, in his person, in his ministry? Why did he need the Holy Spirit's power? Why was it necessary that the Holy Spirit uh, should give him power to do the work that he was sent to do? After all, is he not God, the Son? Does he not have and share the same power and strength to do the work of the Lord, to do his own work, to do his own ministries? Would it not be conceivable and logical to think that he could actually, he could actually uh, go into Galilee by himself and accomplish everything that needed to be accomplished there by himself? The answer is yes. He certainly could have. 
He could have done that. After all, he's one of the three persons of the Godhead, and uh, they are equally powerful, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. He could have done all these things by himself. But he did not. It was not that he needed the Holy Spirit to help him do his ministry. He wanted the Holy Spirit to help him do his ministry. It was not that the Holy Spirit felt that he could not do his ministry by himself, but it was that the Holy Spirit wanted to be part of the ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Father and other portions of Scripture are included in the ministry that Jesus performed in this world. And we need to understand and realize that uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are co-equal. They ha share the same attributes, but they are also closely joined to one another. And they share in their ministries everything that affects one of them affects all three of them. And they desire, they want, they want the company, they want the fellowship, they want the union of the Godhead to remain intact. So, if you've ever thought of that before, it might seem kind of odd or striking that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, who was omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, that uh, he would use the power of the Holy Spirit to do anything in his ministry. So please understand, it wasn't that he needed the Holy Spirit, it was the fact that he wanted the Holy Spirit Amen. to be included, yes. and the Holy Spirit himself wanted to be included, and the Father wanted to be included in the ministry that Jesus was doing in this earth. So therefore, the reputation that follows with the ministry of Jesus Christ, its power, its influence, its effect, how we accept it, how we treat it, it should be multiplied many times over. Because we're not dealing with just one person when we accept Christ as our Savior. We're dealing with three persons. And each of these persons is omnipotent, omnipresent, eternal. So, that should help us to erase some of the problems and the difficulties that have come through the anointing of the Holy Spirit in today's society and throughout church history. Now, uh, there are two words for anoint in the New Testament, and I'm happy to be able to tell you there is no discrepancy, there's no confusion between them. There's one word that means to anoint with oil, and it is strictly only used for medicinal or comfort purposes. That word is never used in any other sense whatsoever. So we don't have to get confused about the word anoint in the Bible. The word that is used for Jesus being anointed with the Holy Spirit of God, that word is only used in the Bible for the anointing of the Holy Spirit and for nothing and nobody else. That's all it's ever used for. So there shouldn't be any confusion on this, in this matter. Is there any confusion in the world today concerning the person and the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And why is that? Because there are a lot of people that just simply will not read and accept what the Bible has to say. Amen. All right. Uh, in the book of Acts, 
<clears throat> chapter 10, uh, we see this emphasis upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in his life. In Acts chapter 10, the Lord has finished his ministry on the earth. He's ascended up to heaven. The disciples have been released to go and preach the gospel to every creature. And a problem comes up. A problem in the church. And that is that uh, uh, the Jews were of a mind that uh, only the Holy Spirit was only for Jewish believers. And they were absolutely convinced about this. And one day, and Peter was convinced about this as well. And one day, Peter um, saw a vision. He went to pray in the rooftop, and he saw a vision, and God showed him in this vision, uh, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And he saw all kinds of animals that would not be delectable or desirable to eat. Have any of you, have any of you ever partaken of octopus? One, two brave souls. I have not. That was a personal choice, by the way. <laughs> uh, I see you're still with us, those of you who did, who tried this. So evidently, it didn't kill you. I'm not going to ask you if you liked it or not. Uh, you can volunteer that information later on. But um, there are many creatures in the world that I would not find appealing. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Israelis are told that it's permissible for them to eat grasshoppers. Okay. But I'm not in the Old Testament. <laughs> I, I don't think I would find that delectable at all. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, at this time, Peter sees all these four-footed creeping beasts and so forth. And the Lord is telling him to arise, Peter, kill, and eat. He says, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And then uh, Peter, uh, the Holy Spirit says to him, well, God hath cleansed that, call not thou common. This is done three times because Peter had a really thick skull. And uh, he wanted to get the point across. The Lord wanted to get the point across. So some Gentiles came at that very moment, and they wanted Peter to come with them and to give them the gospel message. And Peter, as a devout Jew, and the way he had been raised, was very much set against us, very much prejudiced against us, but he'd just seen this vision. He had to see it three times before it sank in, and finally he realized not only was it okay to go, he'd better go. So he went to the house of Cornelius, and these were all Gentiles. And it was not permitted by Jewish law for him to go in there. He went in there anyway because he had been sent. And he preached to them a gospel message. And as he was preaching, they were converted to Christianity. And not only were they converted to Christianity, but Peter and his, the, those that were with him who were Jews were astounded to suddenly realize these individuals, these Gentiles, were being baptized by the Holy Spirit at that very moment. The Holy Spirit came into their lives and into their hearts. They were astounded at this. They were astounded at this. Uh, and uh, uh, Peter's finishing his sermon in verse 38 of Acts chapter 6. says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things. So, uh, <clears throat> while Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, that's the Jews, the devout Jews which believed, were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also <coughs> was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
So we see that right away in the beginning of the church, there was confusion about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. And this continues to this present hour. Um, the three persons of the Godhead are intimately related in the divine work of salvation. And if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, repenting of your sins, and you became a Christian through that, then you have the three persons of the Godhead involved in your life, living in your heart and in Amen. your soul. All three persons of the Godhead are involved in your life. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. There's been much confusion and wrong teaching about the three persons of the Godhead, especially the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but, in, uh, um, in Acts chapter 10, verse 45, they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. They were astonished that the Gentiles received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be astonished as much as you want, but this is God's will. This is God's way. This is God's work. So, keeping this in mind, we see the importance of the role of the Holy Spirit in salvation. In no way detracting from the role of the Lord Jesus Christ in saving us and the role of the Father in heaven in saving us. Do you understand then that when we come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that the door is open for us to enter into a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Godhead. And this is their choice. This is their method. This is their way. It well behooves us to maintain a spirit of godly fear when thinking or teaching about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, and verses 28 and 29, we have a warning that is given to us by Jesus Christ himself. He says, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. So not only do we have the Holy Spirit involved in the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in every respect, but he is fully involved and he is to be carefully revered, acknowledged, accepted, and respected. In John chapter 3, that great chapter of Scripture which speaks about salvation that comes through the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in verse 5, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Amen. So we have an obligation, an opportunity, and we need to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to be able to not only know this, but to acknowledge it and to accept it. And uh, further in John's Gospel, from chapter 3 to chapter 14, chapter 14 and verse 16 Lord Jesus Christ he says to the disciples just before he ascends up into heaven he says and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever now up until this time the disciples had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost that was before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. 
But Jesus Christ said, I'm going to send somebody to you in my absence. <coughs> and he is going to meet your needs and help you as you minister in this world. In verse 26, he goes on to say, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. <coughs> peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. In chapter 15, verse 26, he enters into the same subject matter. He says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And then in chapter 16, and verse 7, Jesus is preparing the disciples to live in this world without him being physically present there with them. And in verse 7 of chapter 16, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. <clears throat> I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not in me. Of righteousness, because they go to my Father. And he see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Yet many things uh, I have to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he, the Holy Spirit, shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and he shall not see me, and again a little while, and he shall see me, because I go to the Father. <coughs> Lord Jesus Christ, in his final address to the disciples, teaching them, is trying to help them understand that he is going away, but they were not going to be abandoned. He was going to leave the Holy Spirit there with them. He is called the divine paraclete. He is the comforter. He is the consoler. He is the advocate. Mm -hmm. He is the intercessor. He is the one that dwells in us mm -hmm. and works through us Thank of his own good pleasure. He is the one that is our, our comfort, a source of comfort for every need, every problem, every difficulty that we might face in this life. He is with us wherever we go, however we go, for as long as we go. When Jesus left this world, he sent his Holy Spirit. He sent his Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. To completely and entirely make up for his physical <coughs> absence. Did you hear that statement? Yes. Why is the Spirit here in the hearts and lives of believers because he was sent by Jesus. When Jesus went away, physically left this world, ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father and to intercede for you and I in heaven, during his absence, he sent his Holy Spirit he sent his Holy Spirit for the purpose to completely and entirely make up for his physical absence. As he said these things, was teaching these things to the disciples that he was leaving them, he was going away, he himself recognized and stated it in the scriptures, because I have told you these things, your hearts are upset. You're sorrowful. He recognized, although the Bible doesn't specifically say it, but they were thinking among themselves at that moment. Jesus is saying, I'm going away. I'm going away. And uh, they're no doubt thinking, well, what are we going to do? 
for the past three years, they had been not having to make up their mind about anything at all. They had been led by Jesus Christ. Let us go here. Let us go there. Let us travel here. Let us do this. This is how we do this. How are we going to feed the multitude? Bring it to me, and I'll show you. In every sense, in every way, they had become incredibly spoiled. Dare I say that? They had become incredibly spoiled about where to go, what to do, how to do it, how to get it done. They had been taught. They had been led. They had been guided. They had been spoken to. The Lord Jesus Christ had been doing this for them for three years. Now he's leaving. He's going away. He's leaving them physically. But he tells them, he encourages them by telling them, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you, you. alone. Uh, so uh, he tells them that he's going to send the Holy Spirit to them. And he does just that. So, have you ever thought as a Christian, I sure wish the Lord was here now, like he was with the disciples. I sure wish in this particular <coughs> circumstance, this decision I've got to make, this problem that I have, this difficulty that I'm facing, I sure wish that I had Jesus Christ right here. <laughs> that I could take a hold of him and I could say, Lord, what are we going to do? Rescue us. We're perishing. The boat is about to sink. What are we going to do? This man's a demoniac. He can tear us apart, limb from limb. What are we going to do? And they got used to the idea that no matter what happened, Jesus was there. <coughs> he had an answer. He had the power. He had the wisdom. He had the ability. He had the will to take care of them. Of all that thou gavest me, Father, I have lost none. Amen. Except the son of perdition. I have lost none. They got used to that. And all of a sudden, one day, he says, I'm leaving you. I'm going away. But he didn't say, you're on your own now. Sink or swim. Sink or swim. Boy, you better, you better watch out now. Because, sorry, I'm out of here. I'm going up. No. Lord Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to completely... Can you remember this? If you don't remember anything else from this message, remember this statement. He sent the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit to his people, his disciples in this world, to completely and entirely make up for his physical absence. Not his spiritual absence, but his physical absence. Absence. His physical absence. And he explains this to them in great detail, verse by verse, John chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. So, are there times in your life when you wish that the Lord Jesus was really physically right there with you? I have. I have. And there have been times in your life when you could just. Physically, verbally, look at him and say, Lord, what should I do here? I, I don't know. Did, did you see this bill? I, I'm not afraid of that. Uh, what, what, what am I going to do? And he says, I'm leaving you. It's expedient for you. I have to leave. I've got something to do for you somewhere else. 
But he didn't leave it at that. Hallelujah. He says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Praise Thank God. You, Lord. So that you can continue living just as if I was still here with you. Hmm. Now, is that your picture of the Holy Spirit in your life? It should be. The Holy Spirit is with you. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you're, the only way you got saved was through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Doing the work Amen. in your heart. And he is sent to abide with us forever. Hallelujah. Thank you. <clears throat> the Lord shows great admiration and gratitude for the place of the Holy Spirit in his own personal experience. In his own personal experience. In his first sermon that he preached, which we began with today, he preached in his own hometown. He read from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me. And all of the people there wondered at the gracious words that came from his mouth. That was the Holy Spirit speaking in and through him. And that's the way it was in all of his ministry. The Lord shows great admiration and gratitude for the place of the Holy Spirit and his own personal experience coming into this world and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The Holy Spirit was involved in all of it. And the Lord was very, very happy and contented to have that be so. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon Jesus Christ, and this is the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ who does the work of regeneration in our hearts, and we are born again by the Spirit of God. Amen. The Bible says, we're born again by the Spirit of God. God, He does the work. He makes the changes. He indwells us. A careful examination, and I've looked through this myself and studied for this message, shows that the Holy Spirit does not anoint anybody. Amen. If you look at it carefully in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is the anointing. Yes. Amen. You see the difference? Absolutely. To have the Holy Spirit is to be anointed. To be anointed for service. To be anointed for ministry. To be anointed with power. To have the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our souls. He himself is the anointing. Uh, and an incredibly, incredibly wonderful ministry this is. In uh, 2 Corinthians in chapter 1, <clears throat> and verses 21 through 22, we read this. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is gone who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. That is the Spirit's ability to give us what we need, what we want, what we desire, most of all whether we know it or not. It is the Spirit of God, the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts that has seals us and keeps us in the good graces of our God. In the epistle of 1 John, chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, and verse 27, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, 
But as the same anointing teaches you of all things in his truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath been taught you, ye shall abide in him. So the Holy Spirit gives us this anointing. He is the anointing of God. Amen. For our service. So everything in our lives that would cause us sadness, sorrow, fear, doubt, because Jesus is not physically right here beside us at this very moment. We don't have Jesus Christ like the disciples had for three years. He's not here like he was with them for those three years. Everything that that amounted to, the Holy Spirit is within us to accomplish also. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wow. Teach us to pray. Holy Spirit yes. will teach us to pray with groanings which cannot be uttered. Amen. Oh, if we're fearful and the terrible storm, the Holy Spirit is there to Amen. calm us, to remind us, to let us know I am with you always. The Holy Spirit is there with us to make up for the physical absence of Jesus Christ yes. during this dispensation. It's going to be wonderful to see the Lord, to be with the Lord again in heaven when he comes again for us to be raptured, to be caught up in the air, to meet him in the air. But uh, until then, we're not popular spiritually. We're not missing out on anything. The Holy Spirit is in us of a truth. Amen. Amen. Oh, what respect we ought to have for Him. How we ought to pray in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, work with the Spirit's power in our lives, acknowledge His presence. Uh, <clears throat> but according to the Gospel of John, chapter 14 and verse 17, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the believer today is not only for service, to serve the Lord, but also for sanctification. For sanctification. Believers <clears throat> need to avail themselves of his ministry by trusting him and acknowledging his presence. <clears throat> so how are we going to live holy lives in this wicked, sinful world? We need to acknowledge the presence and the power and the help of the Holy Spirit. Look at it this way. For three years, Jesus was physically with his disciples. Anytime they got out of line, the tiniest little bit, he was there. Don't you do that! <laughs> Don't you do that anymore. He was there to instruct them, to guide them, to command them, to teach them, to help them. So that they could be the true disciples of the Lord. Now he's gone. He is there. The Holy Spirit is here. And doing what he did. Amen. So, should you be holy? As a Christian? Amen. But how? Amen. How? We have the Holy Spirit of God. That still small voice. Wait a minute. Still small voice. I think I need more than that. No, you don't. Amen. No, you don't. That still small voice is a voice of incredible power. Amen. Amen. Incredible power. So, should we fight against sin? Yes. Can we win against sin? No. Can the Holy Spirit help us win against sin? Yes. yes. Amen. Amen. That's what he's in our hearts for now. He's physically with us, spiritually with us. Amen. For the physical needs, for the physical problems, the difficulties in this life, the Holy Spirit is with us. Um, so, uh, he's here. 
uh, to do two things for the believer, to teach the believer the word, to give the believer an innate ability to know and in an intuitive way things that are spiritual, to cause us to take up residence, to, to take residence permanently with us, to abide with us forever, according to 1 John 2, 27. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit never leaves a believer. He is saved forever. Here is eternal security once again Amen. in the Bible. The Holy Spirit never leaves us nor forsakes us. Forsakes us. Amen. Uh, James chapter 4 and verse 5 says, The Spirit that dwells within us, uh, that is to take up residence, takes up a home in us. The Holy Spirit has come. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit does the work of transforming you, of converting you, of changing you spiritually into the image of Christ. And he takes up his residence with us. Why does he do that? We can't be trusted to be on our own. Amen. I had ten children that grew up. Not just me. My wife had something to do with it too. But uh, <laughs> we had ten children. And uh, for most of their lives, we did not trust them to be on their own. We wanted them to be where we could see them. When they went out to play. We wanted to keep up. Well, where were you? What were you doing? Why are you late? We wanted it. We wanted to keep up with them. Keep aware of them. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in us so that He is there for us. He's there for us. Now, the Bible specifically says that He indwells us. We are His dwelling place. You know what our obligation is? To make him feel at home in our hearts. Do you know what that means? How do you make the Holy Spirit feel at home in your hearts? Get rid of the sin. Amen. Get rid of the sin. How can you do that? Ask. And the Holy Spirit shows you what a sin is in your life. Ask Him to help you get rid of it. This is sanctification. Sanctification is not some person thinking, I'm a strong-willed person. I went to the psychology classes and I learned how to control my mind. Uh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Amen. The Holy Spirit dwells within us to sanctify. That's one of his ministries to us. To teach us God's word and to sanctify us. We need to be people that will submit to his will and his way. Make him feel at home and you will be a holy person. Amen. A holy person. For to yield ourselves to the Spirit's control, guidance, teaching, and strength. Our hearts become his home. What would you think if I came to your home this afternoon and uh, helped myself to anything I wanted and then started telling you what to do with your own house? How would you feel about that? Hmm. I think pastoral politeness would disappear in a hurry. <laughs> and I wouldn't blame you. Holy Spirit, when we accept Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our home. That now is His home. Our hearts are His home. It belongs to Him. That's His home. Amen. He has the right to decide what color the curtains are. What the entertainment is. He has the right to decide and choose what the activities are. What the thoughts are. And on and on and on it is. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives and our hearts for right now. So let me ask you the question. If you had a time in your life when you repented of your sins and received salvation through the power of the Holy Spirit converting you, changing you into the image of God's dear Son. Have you ever had that time in your life? If not, 
you have no hope of heaven. And I want you to think about that this morning. If you're not saved, you need to become saved. You need to let God into your heart.